Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for another AHA Leadership Dialogue discussion. It's great to be with you. I'm Joanne Conroy, CEO and President of Dartmouth Health and the current Chair of the American Hospital Association Board of Trustees. I'm looking forward to our conversation today with my friend and colleague, Tom Prislak, who will share his insights on running an integrated health system. He's been at it for 30 years and he is an expert on this topic. He knows his stuff. He'll share the value that he's seen from being part of a system. Tom is president and CEO emeritus of Cedar sinai Health System. And despite having just transitioned into retirement last month, he was kind enough to join us today. Tom led the transformation of Cedar sinai from a regional hospital into a renowned academic health system. He has spent much of his career championing the important role of health systems and of course, advancing health for those patients and communities served by Cedar sinai Hospitals and health systems are transforming and redesigning how they deliver care to provide patients and communities more convenient, cost-effective, and innovative services. Integration is one of the ways hospitals are continuing to meet the mission of advancing health, where there are constant financial pressures to reduce costs and improve quality for patients. Often, the benefits of integration can be achieved with partnerships and other collaborative arrangements. All hospitals and health systems are focused on delivering high quality care to every patient who walks through their doors every day, full stop. With that kind of responsibility, we have to find ways to be more efficient and stronger. I know this from my experience. For many, integration can lead to meaningful benefits for patients and help hospitals best serve the needs of their communities. So welcome, Tom, who knows this topic better than anyone. But before we jump into our discussion and my questions about integration, could you share a little bit about your experience at Cedars sinai You know, for you to give a synopsis of your career over 30 years and five minutes is unrealistic, but talk about when you first walked through the doors there, what your role was and what your impressions were. And then as you left the organization, you know, what did you think about when you were considering the journey you led them on? Thanks, Joanne, and a pleasure to be with you this morning. So it's interesting you asked that question because actually, as I was transitioning out of the organization, you might imagine there were several sessions around the organization. And that question came up actually about what was my impression when I first arrived. And there were two thoughts that came to mind as I was driving up. And I have this image in my mind's eye as I was driving up to Cedar sinai in 1979, I had this reaction of, gee, it's not as big as I thought it was. And then I realized that I was actually only seeing about a third of the building. <laughs> and so that was, uh, that was lesson number one. But on a more meaningful level, I have to say that there were, there were two characteristics of the institution that have been a part of this institution for as long as I've been here, and I'm sure go back to its founding in 1902. And that is, number one, just an unbelievable dedication to quality and making sure that whatever is done for patients, we're trying to do the best we possibly can for them. And then it's, a, it's been an institution that's committed to excellence. If we can't do something and do it really, really well, Cedar sinai has always just passed because of that commitment to excellence. So, you know, with that kind of foundation in terms of kind of core values coming into the organization, it was a great platform to go from there. With regard to leaving, number one is the preservation and building on those two values over the three decades that I happen to have the privilege of being the CEO and how we have evolved as an institution to try to meet the challenges of providing high quality, efficient care in today's world. And then, of course, the geographic expansion of the organization through the development of the health system, which I, I had a comment actually from from a patient recently about thanking us for the expansion because they got 45 minutes in their life back because they didn't have to travel all the way to Cedar sinai in order to access Cedar sinai services. Well, I had the privilege of joining 
you at your organization a few years ago when I was working out of Washington. And, you know, I was so impressed by the pride that every single person had in the organization. I was also impressed by the amount of traffic. <laughs> and so I appreciate that patient sentiment that it's probably saving them only 10 miles of driving, but 45 minutes of driving time. Exactly. So let's actually talk a little bit about system integration. And we'll start with a broad question to frame the discussion. How do you define what it means to be a health system? And what are the benefits and what are some of the challenges? Well, I think for me, what it means to be a health system is essentially each of the institutions that become a part of a health system asking themselves, whether it's the founding institution as, as it was in our case, or affiliate organizations that have become part of the Cedar sauna Health System, or the organizations with which we have joint ventures, which is another vehicle we've used to build our system. I think it really comes down to each of the institutions asking the core question, what is the path forward for my institution? that will allow that institution to best serve its community and carry out its mission. And um, as we've gone through the development of the system in whatever structural form, we've always made that an important part of the consideration of, in the case of Cedars-Sinai, asking, asking the question of, given the mission of Cedars-Sinai as both a major academic medical center and a full-service community hospital to about 3 million people in Los Angeles, the whole purpose in creating the system, and this is literally embedded in the mission statement of the organization, the system exists to optimize the ability of the member institutions better serve their community. That aspect of what I just described applies whether the integration has been horizontal or whether it's been vertical with integration of our physician network over the years. Yeah, I think that's incredibly important because health systems are there to really serve their members and their communities mm -hmm. because we don't always actually take care of patients at the health system. They're actually taking care of at the member sites. Right. So when you talk about, you know, the commitment to quality and the commitment to excellence, Mm -hmm. When you bring in new members, that's a delicate balance between imposing something on a member versus creating it together. So mm -hmm. it's both political and cultural. You know, what's been your approach to really try to manage that? Right. That's a great question. And the characteristic you just described of what I guess I would call co creating the vision of what it means to be part of a system and be a system, that philosophy of doing it in a co-creating way, as opposed to a kind of a top-down, we know the answer in your local community way, the former is very much the path that we have taken. And the same is true whether that's the development of partnerships and affiliations with hospitals or other health systems or uh, again, with the multiple physician organizations that have become part of our physician network. We do a lot of due diligence on the front end to, number one, make sure there's a very much aligned set of core values that whether, again, whatever the entity is that's becoming part of the system, we really start there and spend a lot of time on, on that question. And we spend a lot of time talking through the philosophy of the institution, which is to take advantage of economies of scale and economies of capability, an important element, I think, that doesn't necessarily always get the same attention, and making sure that there's a common understanding between us and the incoming organization about what that means for them. Back to the point I just made, how the approach that we take in that regard is going to allow that organization to better fulfill its mission and how that affiliate becoming a part of the institution will allow Cedar sinai to better serve its mission. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about recruiting clinicians because I think there's been a little bit of a shift. I know that 
historically, when there was an academic medical center, you know, people didn't want to leave what was the comfortable academic medical center to actually provide services outside of that organization. I think over the last 10 years, that's become a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. And how do you actually use this concept of health system to actually better recruit clinicians? I can tell you our parking is horrible here. So <laughs> a number of our clinicians are happy to work at our other hospitals where the operating room is a little bit more efficient and the parking lot always has spaces. So how do you manage that with your health system? Right. Well, with regard to physicians being recruited here at Cedar sinai on, on that question, it really, first of all, it starts with what's the primary career interest of the physician being recruited? For those for whom their primary career interest is more research related, you know, the conversation there centers around things like access to diverse populations, which is now finally being recognized as how important that is on the on the research agenda. And so Los Angeles being one of the most diverse cities on the planet, we offer that that kind of opportunity to academic physicians. And then secondly, with those physicians who have a more primary clinical orientation, the opportunity for the existence of the system, especially for the physicians who are providing the tertiary and quaternary services, the conversation really stems around how the existence of the system can facilitate the, the ability of Cedar sinai to be increasingly the place where more tertiary and quaternary services, which are of particular interest to that particular physician or surgeon, would be of most interest. And so there's an effort to try to align the purpose of the system with what the professional interest of the uh, clinician or researcher involved. Yeah. How do you actually manage and this is not uncommon for a new member hospital to actually look to the largest member of the organization to help them establish a new service or expand a service that they have at their facility. We, you know, where are those decisions made in a health system? And there's got to be some investment because they're hard to stand up and they're not always as maybe as efficient as it may be at a higher volume institution. Right. Well, so again, that process actually starts during the due diligence effort. Back to what I said a minute ago, we're, we try to take a very respectful approach with regard to clinical integration between Cedar sinai and the affiliates. We're very respectful of the capabilities and quality of the medical community and the local affiliate and very consciously avoid trying to suggest that we're going to come in and fix a problem. Mm -hmm. It's really a question of how can Cedar sinai and our clinical capability complement what already exists in the institution and builds on it for the benefit of that local community. By the way, you know, implementing that really gives emphasis to the importance of the individual who serves as the CEO of that mm -hmm. affiliate organization because, you know, that CEO has to have the kind of trusted and trusting relationship with their medical staff to be able to uh, hopefully guide them through both an understanding and not just an acceptance, but a welcoming of the kind of relationship that I just described. So, you know, and what we would typically do is our clinical leadership engaging with clinical leadership from the respective affiliate and essentially, I guess you could call it going through an inventory. Mm -hmm before we actually proceed with the affiliation, there's a very clear understanding of where the priorities will be and how that, how that will go about, how that might be executed via physicians that would be recruited here to Cedar sinai and then providing those services on some, some basis in the affiliate. But in other situations, what we've done is we've taken the, recruitment ability that an academic medical center has to be able to help those local communities be more successful in recruiting a more experienced and more capable physician or surgeon, depending on the specialty service involved. You know, health systems, as we get larger, have a much broader community responsibility. And 
I know we are investing in transportation, housing, child care, really in a much broader footprint than necessarily one facility. What are the type of things that communities come to you and want your partnership on that actually benefit the broader health of the community? Well, I guess picking up on the conversation we just had, one is the clinical capability. And so part of the strategic planning of the system is answering the question, how are we going to raise the clinical capability in each of the respective affiliates through whatever physician recruitment approach along the lines of what I just mentioned? So the clinical capability question is there. For some of the affiliates, being part of an organization that has the kind of balance sheet that the larger organization has, whether that's allowing the institution to be more cost-effective and have better access to resources because borrowing costs might be lower, is maybe an example on that side. In some of the relationships, the research capability of the institution and how that can facilitate the availability of clinical trials, especially in an area like cancer in one community may, may be of more interest and need in one community versus another. And then finally, each of our institutions as not-for-profits all have community benefit missions. You know, over time, one of the things that, that we carry out is an integration effort on the community benefit side, as much as anything else, to just make sure that as each of the institutions approach their individual community benefit missions, we're doing it in an aligned way and looking for the commonalities of what kind of community benefit activities would be most impactful over the geographic footprint of the system. I guess the, exa and the example I would give in that regard in Los Angeles today, we're all familiar with the challenge of homelessness in America mm -hmm. in general and certainly here in Los Angeles. And so in the area of community benefit work related to homelessness, whether it's grant making or programming that might go on in each of the institutions, you know, sharing information, sharing knowledge about best practices and what we have found to be the most effective strategies in that regard. Yeah, you're right. You know, every single community just seems to have their own specific challenges. Talk a little bit about quality and patient safety. How do you, you know, bring people together? and have them kind of co-create a quality safety culture. You know, I've said that the system is, that its role is to monitor, mm -hmm. but the quality is really kind of owned by the combined organizations. So how have you kind of structured bringing people together and what do you think has been the most effective? All right. Yeah, so uh, I guess I'd begin by reflecting kind of, again, the overall philosophy we've taken, which is the purpose of the system is to assure the optimal success of each of the individual members. We're very much interested in strengthening and not disempowering the local hospital or the affiliate hospital, especially issues like quality. When we bring organizations into the, into the system, part of that due diligence is to make sure we're satisfied it's already a high quality institution. And the question is how can becoming part of the system help make it better? We've taken the approach of in certain areas to pursue a more, what I would call a shared services approach. Mm -hmm. And in others, we're using what we call a collaborative approach. And with regard to how we approach managing for quality, we use the collaborative structure. What does that mean? What that means is that We've gone through a process of, on the one hand, identifying a set of common measures of what quality means across the system and making sure that each of the institutions have focused work that is addressing what those commonly identified quality goals are for each of the institutions, but also leaving room for the local institution to continue to pursue quality priorities that are relevant and unique to that particular institution. We establish what I'll call a common language, a, com a common platform for measurement, agree on how that measurement's going to take place, and then essentially 
use the collaborative model and the knowledge sharing that goes on in the collaborative discussions among each of the management teams from the respective institutions to be able to uh, advance the individual and therefore the collective performance of the system. You know, you bring up a good point that, you know, you can't actually run it centrally, but one thing that is very evident when there's an issue is the resources when you can pull everybody from across the system to address an issue Mm -hmm. are incredibly powerful. I think we had an organization once that was going through a very rough joint commission (laughs) visit. And I think on day two, half the system swooped in there Mm -hmm. to actually assist the team that was there and say, how can we help you? And You know, it's interesting. You you don't appreciate the power of the system until you actually need to use it. And it's often just all of a sudden, instead of having two people on your team, all of a sudden you look behind you and you have 100. It makes people both confident and much more effective. That's an example of what I meant earlier about systems bringing economies of capability or scaling capability within the institution. In a lot of the public policy discussions, there's really a lack of appreciation, I think, from people outside of healthcare delivery about what that means and, and how that can enhance the ability of an institution to provide high quality care. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about costs. You know, it's, it's so different across the United States, but California has been regulated for a long time. And sometimes it is just understanding how to navigate the system and how to measure your costs. How have you kind of created a group that actually can look at cost-efficient care across your health system? That's a pretty narrow area of expertise that requires both finance and utilization management and your data people. How do you kind of set that up so everybody benefits from the combined knowledge? There's a pretty broad range of profile of the organization. So the cost challenges here at Cedar sinai Medical Center, the academic medical center, while there are certain aspects about that that we share in common with the others, since all of us have a community hospital mission, there, there are unique aspects in our particular setting. In terms of how we go about doing it, again, we try to make use of that same kind of collaborative approach that I alluded to with regard to the question of quality in terms of knowledge sharing among the medical leadership teams of the respective institutions with regard to those aspects that we share in common as it relates to things like best practices in patient flow and capacity management, trying to develop and make use of tools like a command center to be able to help facilitate things related to that. Again, trying to bring the resources of the larger system and expanding those across the organization, but also making sure that we recognize that each hospital tends to have its own medical culture. And I think part of the art form of making change from a clinical standpoint when it comes to health system work is one needs to recognize where the medical culture of the affiliate organization is and working through progress in a prioritized way. That's that just recognizes the different capabilities and Mm -hmm. trying to match up system support resources to be able to enable each of the institutions to continue traveling further, I guess, uh, along their own clinical efficiency journey. Yeah. So two of our counties are actually in the mandated bundles. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to start kind of ramping up both our kind of sharing best practices, but, you know, also sharing our data so Mm -hmm. we can actually track how we're performing. I think it's going to be, I don't know if any of your facilities are in the mandatory bundles, but it's going to be a new experience for a lot of organizations. So we're we're not, we, we actually assumed we would be, to be honest with you. And we actually started a number of uh, projects on the assumption we would, Mm -hmm. and we're actually using that framework as a, as one of the structural vehicles for improving our clinical efficiency. Yeah, yeah. You know, it doesn't matter if you're in fee-for-service or you're totally capitated. 
you know, removing right. waste from the system is still benefits everybody. Right. Now, growth for growth's sake. You know, people talk a lot about scale and size. How do you balance, you know, the size question with, you know, the outcomes, which may be improving the health status of the community? You know, I think that's always a big question. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So I guess uh, twofold. One is, I, I guess it does reflect the personal opinion I have about about system size, not just because it's my personal opinion, but to go back to the mission purpose of the system. If the mission of the system is to assure the continued success of the member and affiliate hospitals to be able to better meet their their missions and serve the community, that I think begins to define and put some limit on the size of the system. In our particular case here, you know, our focus is Los Angeles County and the immediate adjacent county areas in Los Angeles. Because if you step back and ask that mission question that I just spoke to and you apply it, having a system any larger than that is not useful for serving the purpose of the mission. Mm -hmm. That's probably the most common question people ask about health systems. How big is too big? I'm not suggesting that larger organizations are necessarily wrong either. Again, it, it really comes down to what is the purpose of that organization and what is its mission? You know, having said all of that, I do worry about size at a certain point the cost associated with managing an organization of a certain size begins to erode either some of the efficiencies or some of the effectiveness. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if you're talking about build, building systems for the purpose we've spent our time here talking about, you're ultimately looking to develop as common a culture, really, at a certain level as you can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, building a common culture uh, over a large geography it strikes me as a really significant challenge. I know how hard it is over the geography that we're serving. We'll have a lot to learn as we look back on, you know, cross-market mergers and, you know, right. people that are jumping geographies to add partners. And yeah, it'll it'll be interesting when we look back five years from now about what were their challenges and what have we learned from that. Right. Well, Tom, I, I want to thank you for giving us some of your time today, and I want to thank all the viewers for joining us today. We really appreciate your valuable insights and your expertise, and we wish you the best in retirement, but I have a feeling your dance card is going to be pretty full. It probably <laughs> already is with people that want you to give them advice about you know building a health system that serves the needs of the communities. Your leadership at Cedar sinai has really been amazing and your contributions to the field really invaluable. So until next time, thank you to everyone. I look forward to seeing you at the next month's Leadership Dialogue. Thank you, Tom, again. Thanks, Joanne.